Jason, thanks for joining me on the Steadfast Running Podcast. Glad I could join you. I'm honored to have you here, and I'm excited to see where this conversation leads as we pick your brain on all things coaching related. But before we get to the coaching chapter of your life, let's talk about Jason the runner. So like many of us, you weren't exactly lighting up the track at a young age. Quick little aside, I was actually just catching up on the results from the Golden South meet, one of the larger showcase meets we have here in Florida. And a freshman from the high school I attended just set the freshman state record in the 800, running 153. Not sure how I feel about kids running that fast at 15 years of age, especially if their training is through the roof to arrive at that type of performance. But be that as it may, let's contrast that with your experience as a freshman going out for cross country to get in shape for basketball. What was it about running that eventually sucked you in? Um, I, I think what sucked me in was um, not only my coach, but knowing that the work that I put in, I got out of um, and I saw the result from. Um, as a team sport kid growing up, I, I played everything and I, I loved working hard and I didn't know any different. But then all of a sudden, when I started running cross country, um, I didn't I didn't understand that lesson early on in my career. I was pretty bad uh, early, but the the longer I stayed with it. Um, and the more I saw, the more work I put in, the, the result came out. I was hooked uh, because I didn't have to wait for somebody to throw me a ball. I didn't have to wait for a coach to give me an opportunity to go into the game. I could show that off every day um, in practice or at a meet. Uh, so what really hooked me was not only the support that my coach had for me and belief that he had in me, um, but also the fact that he was leading me in the right direction. I was just lucky enough to get on that road and follow what he wanted us to do. And by doing that, I was able to see some success. How did your high school coach train you and by extension, the team as a whole? So the, during the summer, we were fairly independent. Um, we had limited contact days, like twice a week we would get together, uh, but it, it was really on us. We had kind of set a goal and he had put um, rewards out for, for different mileages. And it was really on us to just, um, get our mileage in and reflecting back that that probably was more important to me than anything was his time away from us because that's really where I had to make the decision myself if I'm going to put it in and get it done or if somebody else is going to do it for me and as many things that we do as a group now and I love that atmosphere I think there's a lot of value in having each individual have to make that decision on their own to take care of business and get it done. And I think that um, him kind of stepping away during the summer was big for us because um, this is a guy, Coach Acklin had, he was over like a 20 year streak of, of running. And so we knew every day he was getting it in, whether we were there or not, he was gonna get it in. So it was our responsibility that, responsibility that we got it in as well. So um, during the summer, he was very hands off. Now during the season, um, when I say hands off, I don't mean that he wasn't there, right? He, we were there twice a week, but really left it to us. But during the season, um, we were very specific on what our goals and our intentions were. Um, we, we got a training plan every day with great detail on, on what we would be doing, reservoir repetitions. I mean, very, we knew what we were getting into was made for us because everything was very specific to the work that we had put in during the summer and where we were at. Um, so his intentionality of what he was giving us during the year, I think helped create that independence in the off season, knowing that when we showed up, he was going to be prepared for wherever we were at and take care of wherever our fitness was to help us train. So um, he was a great motivator. Um, he was a, a great, a great scientist. I mean, Really, a coach has to be a great scientist and look at every kid as an experiment and be able to take that experiment and optimize it. And, and he was one heck of a, 
uh, scientists along the way. And I think that's one of the things I appreciated most. And, and even now reflecting back, uh, he's so far ahead of the curve in my brain on what training was and where he uh, had goal times for us. And I wish I would have absorbed a little bit more of that sooner in my career, but I'm thankful I still have a great relationship with him now. What did the training architecture look like in season from a bird's eye view that you can recall? So the only thing I would say that we miss from what we would consider, most people would consider a good training plan now is, is our long runs were not nearly as long as what we do now, um, but everything else was present um, in a cycle. So for us, it was roughly a seven day cycle, but um, oftentimes we'd have a VO2, a threshold economy workout, and we would do strides or speed stuff on recovery days. I mean, we touched on every energy system all year long. It wasn't just one thing for an extended period of time, and then another thing. We really did hit everything. And, and that's why I say, looking back, I think he was ahead of the curve because you know that's something that we really push for now is to make sure everything's present all the time. Um, you know, Never to be too far away from race shape. You know, there's, there's always this coaching adage, well, we'll get there, we'll get there, don't worry about it, we'll get there. And as I agree with that, um, I also think that the excitement of the sport is racing. And especially for these kids to draw fun from the sport, the more often they can be close to that fitness as the year goes on, the more exciting it is for them. Um, obviously, it's fun to dump time at the end of the year and beat people you never beat. And that still happens. But I think it's also important to be competitive all year long, especially for somebody who's um, new to the sport, which most high school kids are. You know, I was talking with one of my senior girls um, the other day. I said, you know, Olympians will train four years to drop a second off of their time. I said, do you think I could keep a high school student, you know, invested into the sport, telling them, OK, you'll drop one second from this time from freshman year to senior. It just wouldn't happen. Right. So I think it's important for them to find that success along the way and not just one shot all at the end. Considering that you found success in high school by jumping on a bike and doing quite a bit of cycling, is that something you encourage others to do? If they enjoy it. I think, you know, we talk about when kids get hurt or um, even during the, the summer, you know, find the cross training activity that you enjoy most. And I was fortunate enough to be on a cycling team and that that was the team environment as well that I was missing during cross country season. So I felt invested into, you know, riding with my teammates and one of my um, former teachers was on that cycling team who I had a great relationship with. And so um, it was awesome being the little kid on this team and they just took me under their wing and, and rode thousands of miles uh, it, to improve. And honestly, I love doing it. And so with our kids, I, I have a, uh, a freshman this year, um, that we made a summer plan and, and talked about his training, but he loves the Tour de France and he's a huge Jan Ulrich fan. And so when, when I go with him on runs, all we do is talk about the Tour de France. And so he's going to be riding every single day. Um, and I, I love it. I love it. You get your heart rate up and you love what you're doing. There's nothing better. If I had kids who love to swim, go do it. You know, it, it's awesome to do. It's non weight bearing, you know, as long as you're recovering from it, you're good. So I just don't find a lot of those kids. I mean, I know I was unique in that situation. I didn't have a lot of teammates that did that. Um, but if they love what they're doing, why not do it? Looking at your progression, you went from someone who could barely stay with the girls your freshman year to a major player on a championship caliber team your senior year. What were your PRs going into college? Oh, geez. Um, so when I was, when I was a high school athlete, I think I ran 448 and 1014 for two miles. And I think I ran 202, um, in the 800, you know, nothing crazy. Um, for three miles, I ran 1550 or 1555, right in that range. Um, it's funny because at Detweiler back to the old, uh, single shoot races for cross country, you know, um, at Detweiler, one of the races was so big that if you were on the back side of the bell-shaped curve, you weren't even going to get to the finish line before you got stopped because the chute got backed up. And so my mom has this picture of me, which would have been my first time under um, 16 minutes, 
stopped before the finish line because I couldn't get through the shoot in, in time. So I think I ran 1611 or something, uh, but uh, it's just a, it's a great photo. It puts a smile on my face to see uh, the clock and me stopped before the finish line trying to get through the shoot. Yeah, I can see that being a memorable photo. <laughs> <laughs> what was the transition like for you going from high school to college, having to adapt to a new system and a new coach? Honestly, the the thing that I took with me was the pride in the tradition that I had in high school and tried to, at first, tried to just make sure that I stayed sharp on all the things that Coach Ackman wanted us to stay sharp on when I went to the new team. Um, I, I really didn't have, I didn't have expectations. I only knew a couple of my teammates going in um, that I had ran close with. Um, and I knew they were better than me. Um, I knew I was back in that position where I was going to be the slowest kid on the team. And honestly, it was almost comforting because I knew I could just work my tail off and, and hopefully do my best to earn a spot. And, and I didn't care if I was number one, five, seven, 10, 30, you know, like the expectation coach Acklin had on this was just do the best you can do. And, and really that mentality, I think helped me um, every day in practice in college was like a race. Um, I think this was prior to recovery days being a thing. And, <laughs> you know, I, I'm terrible at hills. And anytime we'd have hills, I would literally have to sprint ahead so I could get up the hill so I wouldn't get dropped by the group on the, on the way back. And in that, doing that every day um, probably didn't lead to long-term health for me, but it, it gave me great improvement in such a short period of time. I mean, I remember one of my very first um, eight Ks in college and we went through the mile at 445 and I looked at my teammate who was next to me and I, I literally hit him on the shoulder and said, that's my mile PR. And then we ran through two miles and we were sub 10 and I hit him on the shoulder again. And, and I said, that's, that's my two mile PR. And, and so same way all the way around. I mean, I ran three K PR, three mile PR, five K PR, and then obviously ran eight K PR. And, and I don't think I was tired at the end of that race. I was just so excited to see the progress uh, in um, the patients pay off because at that point I really only had, my training age was only three years, really, um, because even though I ran cross country for four years, I didn't really understand summer training and I didn't stick with winter training the way I should have uh, my freshman and sophomore year. And so my training age was really like three at that point. And so I was seeing progression that you would see a high school junior, a high school senior take. I mean, just at astronomical climb on success in such a short period of time, because Finally, I was able to put these seasons together back to back to back. And that that was just unbelievable watching that pay off in such a short amount of time. And I was excited for it because it wasn't something I expected or I knew was going to happen. It just happened. And I think that was the best part. Now, after tearing your Achilles tendon in college, did you make a clean break with the competitive runner in you or were there any comeback attempts in there or any desire in your 20s and 30s to continue racing? So when it happened, um, I did six months of, they gave me two, two ultimatums. You have surgery and it's over or you go therapy every day for six months um, and, and we'll see what can happen. And so I didn't want it to be over. Um, so I went to therapy and I, I just couldn't, it doesn't bother me now, but the tension in my Achilles trying to return at that level, I think psychologically was a difficult um, break in my brain. Um, you know, I was at a junior college and transferring to a four-year institution. I, I knew the college coach at Eastern very well, Coach McInerney. Um, and he said, hey, just show up and try to run. And so that summer I tried to put in some miles in it. And to me, it was tough to do by myself. I think that if I, I would have been able to accept the fact, maybe there would have been more of a comeback in there, but it, it was just too much. Um, I don't know if I just felt like I was a shell of myself um, because physically, honestly, I, I ran, I mean, not to compete, but I, I continue to run and I do to this day and, and I don't have any side effects from it now. Um, I just think trying to get over that hump, I was in the position as an athlete um, that was going through injury and my brain wasn't in the same place. My wife, who I was dating at the time, she told me I turned into a demon. I mean, 
physically and psychologically, you turn into a completely different person. And, you know, there's a chemical imbalance when you're not exercising the way that you normally do. Um, and I think I learned a lot about myself years later going through that experience, which I'm actually thankful for. Even though it ended it, I'm, I'm thankful I went through that because now I can connect with those kids that are struggling on our team to cross train and get over those barriers themselves. Um, try to help them feel like they're not by themselves. Absolutely. There's a dark side to injury. So how would you describe your relationship to running right now? <clears throat> so when COVID hit, I was on this uh, running streak and one of my alumni had come back and we went for a run and I tore my meniscus. And so my streak ended. Um, and so not at the end of the world, I, I recovered from my, my meniscus and we were at a meet at Terre Haute uh, racing under the lights um, at Laverne Gibson. If you've ever been to Laverne Gibson, it's absolutely beautiful course, but between where the course is at, it's very rough terrain. And so it's at night, they race under the lights. And so um, I told our kids, I said, do not get her running around cheering on your teammates in the dark. So sure enough, very first race, I roll my ankle worse than I've ever rolled it before. Um, and this is in October. And so I've been out since October not able to do much. I, I, uh, I've now with that being said, I've started running again. I've been trying to get in walking five miles a day. I've been starting to get my runs back up. I I'm at 10 minutes now, which doesn't seem a lot to anybody, but to me, like I'm back on the horse, like we're going to make this thing happen again. So I absolutely love running because I love to suffer. Like I love that feeling of discomfort in your body and your lungs. I, it's funny because when I got done today, I was taking a deep breath and and like it was kind of hard to breathe because I haven't been in that spot for a while. And, and I just smiled. And I like, man, I, I miss this so much. Just that feeling of improvement, um, because I think the feeling of suffering is the feeling of improvement. You know, something positive is happening as long as you can distinguish between pain and injury. <laughs> I'd like to dig into this a little deeper because I find it fascinating for runners like us who are past our prime and we still, as you said, love to suffer. What is the motivation right now for you to continue suffering? And I think you hinted at it, to continue improving, but is it to continue improving from year to year or from your last race to your current one? Because you're not, you're not gonna be setting lifetime PRs. So when you talk about right. improvement, what do you mean? Well, honestly, I, I think, you know, physical activity is such a huge part of, should be such a huge part of people's lives. You know, it, it balances everything. It balances how you eat, how you sleep, how you recover, um, the things you put in your body. Um, and I think that's a necessity that a lot of people leave out. And, and to improve for me is to continue to stay um, physically fit, you know, and mentally fit. And when I run, I am in such a better place mentally and exercise than, than when I am any other way. And I cycled a lot, but your heart rate doesn't get up the same way. You know, I tell the kids, you, you know, I say, well, yeah, I, I would ride 30 miles a day. And that's crazy. I said, well, the Tour de France, they're riding like 100 miles a day for a month straight. So to give you an idea. It's not that many miles, you know, like people can do this stuff. And, and so for me, my improvement is the improvement on my health and, and making sure I'm staying active. And, and I know, it, even if I don't want to believe it, I'm a role model for my kids and they're watching the things I'm doing. And if I'm coming back from injury and I can get out the door every day for 10 minutes, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make it happen, you know? And what does that mean? That means that one or two kids may look at that and go, well, if he's getting out the door, surely I can do it. Um, I'm watching him, his rear end limp around out there and run around from spot to spot. Um, I know it's not easy to do, but he's getting it done. And so maybe it's a little motivating. I don't do it to motivate kids, but I know that I looked up to people and I still look up to people and watch what they do. And so I know somebody has got to be looking up to me and I want to make sure that I'm setting the best example possible. Yeah. I love that leading by example. So let's open up the coaching chapter of your life. Was it in college while injured that you began to seriously consider coaching as a career path? 
you know, I kind of always knew I wanted to be a teacher. I just had so many positive people in my life that were teachers for me. Um, not that I knew that I could fill that role, but I knew that um, they had done so much for me, like the least I could do was try to give back. And so having the great coaches in my life, it just seemed like it was, was going to be a fit. I, I learned so much. It was almost my way of repaying them was, was giving back the things that um, they had taught me. And so when I, when I was injured, it kind of accelerated that process um, coaching at, well, I student taught at, at Charleston High School. I didn't have to worry about myself at all. I could be fully invested in the team while I'm in college. So on one end of it, I get hurt and it ends my collegiate career. But on the other end of it, being hurt allowed me to invest more time into my athletes. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, yeah, would I have loved to have continued to improve? Sure. Um, but the life path I'm on, I mean, it was almost a blessing for it to end that way um, because I got to really invest in the kids. And I was fortunate enough that the program at Charleston High School, I was able just to, to jump right in and, and do everything with um, the distance kids and set everything they were doing. Um, and that was awesome. That, that was awesome to be able to give everything you got and uh, it'd be so well received by those kids. Could you talk about your mentors? And obviously your own coaches are big ones and please do give them credit. But I'd also like to hear if there are also any coaches that you've admired from afar, like researchers, sports scientists, or mainstream coaches that you've studied or looked up to for a long time. So this is a... Uh... The it, list of this goes across the country. Um, so, uh, you know, I, when I started, obviously my, my biggest mentors were uh, my coaches because my, my web wasn't very big at that point. Um, but I went to a Hall of Fame banquet when my high school coach went in at, um, into the Illinois State Hall of Fame. Um, and I got to start to know some more coaches and this web started to grow and grow and grow. And I started hosting my own clinic at my house where I just brought people in. And we've had 40 plus coaches just sit around my, sit in the living room around tables and, and talk. And, and this, what I found was, and I, I say this because I know some of our kids connect this way. Sometimes our kids feel like they're alone in the decisions that they make. The rest of their classmates don't make the same decisions to, to be great athletes and go to bed early and make some of the sacrifices that they do. And I think sometimes as a coach, we can feel like we're on that Island at times. Um, and my wife was tired of me spending every weekend at somebody else's house. So I just brought them all to my house. And so what I found was building these relationships with these coaches. I've got a giant web of people that think the exact same way I do that are all across the country. And it was awesome to be able to connect with them. I mean, they're like long lost brothers and sisters that I've had. Um, we'll, we go to meets um, and the kids go, do you know every single person? Yeah, because we share and we talk. So, I mean, the list goes on, you know, Jay Johnson really got me started into this thing. Uh, we went out to the clinic out there and I got to just talk with him and John Sippel at Downers Grove North has been my great friend since I was in high school um, attending, yeah, you running camp. Um, those two guys, uh, just the framework of everything that's involved. Uh, Coach Vol Todd Voland at Decatur St. Teresa, he was one of the first clinics I went into, and he had sat down and talked to Coach Acklin, who was my coach, to learn what to do with his program. Well, they won four state titles in a row, Decatur St. Teresa girls. And when I sat at the clinic, he said, yeah, I sat down with Coach Acklin, talked about his 90s teams and early 2000s. And I sat back in my chair and go, that, those were my teams. They're doing the things that we were doing. And so building that culture, and I, I shook his hand after um, and said, you know, I said, I appreciate, you know, listen to you. This, um, I'm a kid from that team. Um, and he was at my house yesterday uh, celebrating the holiday with us and, and cooking out. You know, those relationships that I've built through coaching are just amazing. Um, Eric Detman, uh, Dave Frank, 
Timo Mo- Monster. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, I, I feel like I'd leave somebody out. Jeff Blue, or uh, yeah, Blue and, and Jeff Belay. And, I mean, it's just crazy the amount of people, um, you know, uh, going to Aruba with Paul Vandersteen on Saturday, you know, like the, the list of people, John O'Malley texting my son and congratulating him after races. I mean, the, the list of coaches. And I, I think the people I admire are the people in this sport that, um, I can connect with because they think the way I think. And to be able to have that instant connection, um, we can talk on the phone or we can Zoom um, and, and just absolutely um, enjoy being together and not just talking about running stuff. So I got a lot of people I admire. And I feel like I leave the Portland Coaches Social that happens on Thursday nights um, it is a blessing uh, for me and my family. And I, I've met so many people we went out to trials last year and I had free places, beds to stay on. Thor Espenson um, is one of my best friends. And, you know, we've been in person together like four times. Um, and so it, it's been awesome um, just to connect and, and uh, admire all the hard work that these people put in and know that they're human. So I know that's really long winded, but I mean, the list of coaches that I admire just is forever long. It is awesome. And I can't add to that. That's perfect. Uh, a, a fitting tribute to all the people. And like you said, you're, you're not able to name everyone, but all the people who have had an influence on you and vice versa. Right. So high school coaching can be a wonderful thing. And I've talked to coaches who say that's what they've enjoyed the most or what they'd like to return to someday. Why did you choose to focus on high school runners where, you know, you could have gone in any other direction? Uh, Honestly, uh, why high school? I connected really well. My, my wife was a, is a teacher as well. And I'm a teacher. And so that route was, I hate to say easiest for us at that point, but, but really it was. And then the groups that I've had the, uh, um, opportunity to coach I just kind of fell in love with them uh, and I've had some great people uh, that happen to be athletes along the way um, and our the success that these teams have found um, it, it's 100% them I mean yeah I'm there to help them out and, and show them but I'm more of an advisor than a coach I can tell them what to do but in the world of distance running you've got to make that decision to do it. And so I've been lucky enough that I've been surrounded with people who've made those positive decisions and, and done some great things. Um, I love watching them grow. I love watching kids grow up. Um, I love it when they have weddings. I love it when they have kids. I'm now one of my very first um, athletes could be my boss. She's a principal. So like, it's, it's so much fun to watch them grow up. I think that's, that's the most uh, enjoyable part because with distance runners they're often really good people as well and then watching good people grow up they do some pretty amazing things in life you obviously connect very well with high school aged runners so you're the perfect person to ask this question to i am not at the high school level i am at the elementary school level i teach pe and we still get a lot of kids who come out to PE and all they do is talk to their friends or at worst, they get in the way of what I'm trying to do for the other kids. What is your coaching style? You know, you said that you're more of an advisor, maybe you're more hands off, or maybe you can talk in terms of issuing some tough love when that tough love is needed amongst your high school runners and what I'm trying to get at is how how do you relate to these kids and and specifically to the tough cases that's a great great question I I honestly think that um, no two cases are the same and every single one is different not necessarily because of the circumstance but maybe because of the relationship you have with the athlete and I think you handle them differently um, according to how what kind of relationship you have with the kids. So for example, in my strength training class, if we have kids that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, 
Um, I will go up to him and go, hey, you and I both know you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Like, if you want to get on board with it, great. If not, here's your options. Um, but then at the same time, if I've got a great relationship with that individual, um, you know, I, I will have more of a tendency to be able to dig in a little deeper. Now, not that you don't try to do that with the other kids, um, but when it comes to a point where they don't want to develop that relationship with you, there's not a lot you can do about it. You can try to help the best you can and know that you're there for them to help. Um, but that relationship has to be there. Um, we've had that on teams in the past. Um, people make bad decisions and where, what they want to get out of this sport, because it is a sport, you know, it's fun, it's enjoyable. And if you don't find the fun and enjoyment in it and you're doing these other things, do something else. You know, I, I say too often, this isn't the 5K club, right? Like you're here for a purpose. And as much as we are here to get better and to enjoy each other, we still want to be competitive. And if being competitive means being competitive with yourself, there's still just a level of understanding and focus that you and I have to have together in order to find success. Um, and so every case is different depending on the um, relationship I have is kind of, I approach them differently. Um, I would say the issues I've had over the last 18 years, I don't know that I've handled two the same and I've screwed up a bunch of them. I mean, I've, I've done terrible on lots of them, but there are a few that turned out well and, and our bonds are much stronger because of it. You put a lot of effort into building those strong relationships with your student athletes and I know you try to get involved in their lives apart from what goes on at practice. How do you balance being a dad, a husband, a teacher, and the type of coach that is committing himself fully to his athletes? I think the easiest way to, to explain that is, is like this teeter-totter. Uh, if, if I'm the one that's trying to develop that relationship with the athletes, but it's not reciprocated, then I get farther away from my base and farther away from my family. But if I am, if I invest a ton, but they invest a ton on top of it, I, I can still stay balanced. So I think that investing into those kids um, is easy to do when they can reciprocate that back at you and communicate with you and help you out along the way, because then they understand those tough times. This is the first year that I've missed the girls' state finals. Um, and we had the, one of the best four by eights I've ever coached. We had the fastest girl in the mile I've ever coached. And I missed the final because my son was racing in the state championship um, to try to win a state title in the 800. And luckily he did. But they understood that uh, I was not going to be there and I was going to go watch my son because of the relationship I have with those gals. Um, it's reciprocated. If I just said, hey, I'm not there, and I was the one putting in all the effort, they may have been upset, but they were just as excited for me to go watch my son, um, knowing the time commitment that all parties put into this thing. So it's easy to stay balanced when it's reciprocated. I mean, I cannot honestly say that I have the same relationship with every kid because it's just not true. You try to invest in every kid, and then when it's reciprocated back, it makes it easy along the, and fun along that journey. Great answer. It's a two-way street. It's for okay. sure. So I've got to give you a chance now to brag about Lance. So how, <laughs> how, pra how proud are you as a dad watching him grow up around the sport and develop into a young man? Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, my wife, had, I used to coach basketball and my wife has a picture of me holding him when he's like, I don't know, less than two weeks old at a basketball game. And so he's grown up around sport his entire life. Um, and when COVID hit, uh, let's, let's shoot back another year. When he first started running cross country and track, he knew this circle of coaches that have been at my house and, you know, he's gotten them chips or gotten them a water while they've been hanging out. Right. And so John Sipple, who's one of my best friends, we were coming back from um, Boulder and I blame him for everything Lance does. So let's just start with that. But um, Lance is on the phone and, with me and he goes, Hey, can I FaceTime sip and, and talk about training? And I go, well, sure. But I mean, you know, I can help you if you want. He's like, no, I want to talk to sip. So here we are delayed in 
Denver's airport and John Sipple is talking to Lance in fifth grade um, and, and just talking to him about training and in the, the things that they're talking about are not what a fifth grader would be talking about. Right. And he's developing this relationship with an adult and talking to an adult um, about training stuff that blows my mind. And so John is responsible for all the downfalls of the <laughs> crazy stuff Lance has done. So COVID hit and Lance has a, a, a vlog that he does. He interviews coaches and athletes uh, and his circle is just as wide as mine, if not wider. Um, I'll come home from meets and he'll tell me, hey, I was talking to so-and-so and talking about their race. And, and we're watching the Florida State meet because he's connected with kids in Florida. And we're watching, you know, we're watching all things in Oregon because he knows the kids out there. I mean, it's just absolutely wild. And, and the fact that he loves what he's doing, but he, he's educated on the sport, um, it is crazy. The opportunities, you know, we're going Thursday. He's going to race in St. Louis. Uh, Festival of Miles, and then we'll go out to Nike Outdoor Nationals to race the, mile, the eighth grade mile out there. I mean, just just crazy the opportunities he's given himself. And the thing to keep in mind with Lance is that um, he's a coach's kid, but he doesn't run a ton. He runs when he's in season, and now he's getting a little more focused. He, he'll be a uh, high schooler. Um, he was only running, you know, 15 to 20 miles a week, you know, during the, the school year, and he's not running 50 miles a week. He's doing these things um, at a small volume and enjoying them. But the difference is the consistency that he's doing them is where he's finding his success. Um, and I think the consistency of talking to Robbie Andrews on the phone or, or talking to those, these people and just enjoying running um, as a sport, um, I'm super proud of him. I, I could, it it's blows my mind, right? I had this deal with him. Uh, I said, every one of my PRs you break, you, I can't remember what the deal was. You're going to get something. And so my high school mile PR is 448. And I, Thursday, he may end up beating that. And he's not even technically in high school yet. So I'm like, oh no, I'm going to be forking out something. I don't remember what it is, but I'm sure he'll tell me as soon as it happens. Uh, it's oh, absolutely that's... wild. That is great. Thanks for sharing that. And are you going to be coaching him next year? I, I will. Um, the good thing is, I think he could coach himself. Um, I'll be there to motivate him and push him along, but I, he does a good job. And he's friends with a lot of the kids on the team already. So, I mean, he's grown up around him his whole life. So, that, it'll be a lot of fun to watch him grow in the success as he goes. And whether he's successful or not, I don't care. As long as he's having fun, that's all that matters. Right. Yeah. And apart from this family environment that you've created at St. Joe and the relationships, going back to what we were talking about earlier, what else do you think is behind the success that St. Joe has had? I think, <laughs> and Jay, Jay can take all the credit for this, but I think it's the consistency. Um, the consistency within the coaching staff, people who are passionate about um, coaching and it's not, it's a lifestyle for them. It's not a job or a profession. Um, being a runner is a lifestyle and doing those things on a consistent basis. We go on vacation, you know, we went to um, Memphis and we just run around Memphis, you know, downtown and, and stop and look at the sites. You know, we're not running to train all the time. We're running to have fun. You know, we're going exploring places. We'll stop, we'll walk. You know, it's not, hey, you can't stop on your run. You got to make sure you get this in. Like, we're enjoying running. And I think um, the consistency of that in our program has been really important. The views of the coaches that have come through, that's the one steady thing that's been there is to enjoy it for what it is and not make it more than what it is. It is not life or death. It is an opportunity we have um, to find some personal success and some team success along the way. I imagine that you also look for runners to step up. And that's one component of the culture that you try to instill at St. Joe based on what your high school coach asked you to do once, right? I think that's a story yeah. worth bringing up. <laughs> so my sophomore year of track, um, I could tell you exactly where I stood. I was in a four by eight with 
three kids who were very fast and me who was like a 220 guy. Um, and, and we finished the race and I don't know what place we ended up, but we were looking at the splits and he said, all these guys are going to be gone next year. Somebody needs to step up. And that is literally the only made motivational conversation he and I ever had face to face. And I could repeat it. I mean, I could face the same direction. Um, we still go to a meet there and I, I see it every time I walk by there. And if a coach takes the time to ask an athlete or say that somebody needs to step up, they're probably pointing in the direction of that specific athlete. And I was just fortunate enough to maybe understand that at that moment um, and took it really to heart. And, you know, we ask all of our kids every year. Um, I just had a conversation with one of our seniors this year. And I said, look, I said, in this world, it doesn't matter what your age is once you get past high school. I said, you don't have to be a senior to be a linear leader. You could be a freshman. You could be a sophomore, junior, senior. I said, the problem is that we as high school think that seniors have to be leaders. I said, that's not the case. I said, the only way you're going to lead is if you truly do the things that are necessary to lead. I said, because if you don't and those kids lead you, then you're leading us the wrong way. You're leading us downhill. I said, but it doesn't have to be that way. I said, a freshman could lead us. I said, there are kids on this team that are doing things the right way. They lead. And, and it's not a title. It, it's not a captain. It's not what it is. It's just doing the right thing. Um, and so I think it's important that kids understand that leadership isn't a title. Leadership is what you do and how you act and, and how you carry yourself more than it is. You want to call them a captain or a leader. Yeah, I used to do that. I mean, I, I had interviews for people who want to be leaders. I've had them read books and take tests. I've done all kinds of things and it's never worked better than what it was. So I just quit giving the title. If you're going to lead us, then just do it. I, you don't need to be called a leader to do it. A, a teacher in a classroom, they don't say, oh, that teacher is a leader. They're just a teacher. That's just what they do. So if you're on this team and you're an upperclassman, you should be pulling this the right direction. That's kind of what we expect. I um, mean, we we lay the expectations down clear as day on what that looks like. Be on time. Don't be late. You're going to be late. Don't be a leader because the le leader is going to be the first one there so they can check in, make sure everything's ready to go. And they can talk to those kids that show up early. You know, they're going to do those little things. And so um, it's important to not have the title. It's important to do the things necessary. Um, so that's what we expect. I mean, that's the stepping up. Stepping up is learning your role and making sure you take care of it. Well said. Yeah, well said. Could you give us a quick rundown of the 2021-2022 season? Did you meet your expectations? And what goals do you have for your teams moving forward? So cross country and track, um, well, starting with cross country, with the guys and the girls, um, the girls blew expectations out of the water. Um, we had a small group coming back. Um, and I had two of the fastest girls I've ever coached. But one of them was not when she started. Um, she, her story is a lot like mine and just worked her tail off. And COVID was a great thing for her. And they ended up for, uh, in fourth place at the state meet in cross country. Um, and they were seven points out of a trophy. But I don't know if I've ever been more excited for a team, given the adversity that they had in their accomplishments. Um, the guys were seated number one all year long. But they, they were not the people who put the seat on top of them. They are a great group of kids. Um, but they didn't have a low stick. And at the state meet, if you don't have a low stick, you're not going to win it. And so I think for them, it was a, a little disappointing. They finished in sixth place, um, which is a great finish. But, you know, having the one on your head, uh, you kind of expect more than that coming out. And I could tell, I told them all year long, we got to have a low stick. And, and I said, this is not a negative towards you. It's just what has to happen in order to score or, or to get a state title. And we just didn't have a low stick and they ran well, um, but they ended up sixth place. So they were a little disappointed. It was what it was uh, going into the spring. Um, I think they're both groups were um, a little bit fired up and ready to go. Indoor state was great for both of them. Um, second for the, the guys in the four by eight on indoor state and the girls were third, uh, not indoor state prep top times. It's, it's essentially the indoor state meet for our class. And then outdoor, um, two of the fastest four by eights I've ever run, uh, have ever run for me um, at the end of the year. And the girls ended up breaking 950 and the guys were um, under 815. So they ran 812 and change. And so for us, that's pretty good. And 
fastest girl miler. She ran 513 and she's a freshman. She's going to go out to Nike with us um, in the middle of next month. So um, we ended we ended with high performances on the people that buy in and do the things we're asked. And that's that's all I can ask for, whether that's one pe person or 20 people. Um, it's fun to see the results of the people that are investing into the sport. Yeah. And are there any mistakes that you've made as a coach, not necessarily this season, but collectively over the years that could serve as advice or a cautionary tale to younger coaches? Absolutely. And I, I, uh, I mean, probably within the last week, I've, I've made mistakes as well. But I, I think that you can't go wrong when you're when you're trying to lay the precedent of communication. I think the, the precedent of communication is the thing that most coaches screw up on because we can't read minds. Um, we, you know, we've had a conversation with the kid at one point. We probably haven't refreshed it enough along the way, um, and it causes conflict somewhere along the way. And I think that communicating with them, laying that expectation um, is where I and most people screw up most often. And um, if I was to tell you anything, it would be um, make sure that on a regular basis, you're having either some sort of one-on-one -on -one or checking in with every kid individually um, and not assuming. You know, I had a conversation with at one time with a, an athlete two weeks prior, and it was like they completely forgot that conversation two weeks later, and, and there was a big blow up, and, and it was I mean, I take the full blame for not keeping that fresh in their brain on what the season was going to pan out to. But um, it's one of those things you can't read minds, you can't predict. But the more you can communicate, the less likely you got to read minds and less you got to predict. Um, that's number one. That's hands above number one. Most screw ups. Yeah. And the larger your team, the more challenging it is to do those frequent check ins and keep the communication at a high level. Uh, coach, what are the best ways you think for coaches like you and me to increase our level of competency if we're talking specifically about education for coaches, professional development, that sort of thing. And I know that you already alluded to the clinic that you host in your garage. So clinics would definitely be up there. Is there anything else that, that comes to mind? I think that's how you start. I think that's how you get your foot in the door. And then once you connect through a clinic, you kind of get the personality of coaches that you connect with better and that you can bounce things off of. And then your circle just grows and grows and grows. And I, I really believe, you know, as a coach that it, when I got started sitting on people's couches every week, um, just talking about training stuff, asking what they did. I really believe that's the best way to start is find that that person you're comfortable with and just ask them questions. This sport isn't a secret. Anybody that wants to keep training a secret from you probably isn't a great coach. Um, I could list every every coach um, that's been at Nike over the past 10 years that I've talked to and not a single one of them. Um, has said, well, I'm not going to share that with you. They're, they're willing to give you exactly um, every single rep and rest interval that any kid ran along the way. So um, invest in the people that are willing to invest in you. I mean, that's the story of life, right? But we coaches, we all think alike and we're trying to help each other. And here's the other thing to keep in mind when you're a young coach. Your perspective may be a little different, but you may have something just as valuable towards somebody who's been doing it a long time as anything. You know, I, I don't consider myself a young coach anymore, but I feel that way. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing it going on 18 years and I still people who get in the profession, things that they did in college or things that they've been taught. I love hearing from anybody. It doesn't matter if you've been doing it for one year or 100 years, you probably bring something of value. Um, and understand that you belong in a circle. Um, sometimes we like, I can't talk to those people. They, their school's a lot bigger than ours. They, they don't connect with us. I, I just don't believe in that stuff. They're just people. Um, and so if you're, you're a new coach getting started, just find somebody and talk to them and you'd be surprised how quick your circle will grow. 
What time of year do you host the Central Illinois Distance Summit, if that's what you still call it? Yeah, uh, we normally do one in the summer um, and then we've done one in the winter. So like, right, we've done it Foot Locker weekend. So we watch Foot Locker on, on uh, TV and then continue the summit um, at that point. Um, but typically we try to do it at the end of the cross country season. And then we do it like in the middle or towards the end of the summer. So the idea is, if you're bringing in new training things or you want some ideas for the season, you get it before the cross country season. Then once you do it in December, it, doing it in December is like, okay, where did we mess up? <laughs> what went wrong or what went really well? Um, and talk about how we're going to transition into track. And so um, we've done two, the last couple of years, we've done um, a couple on Zoom, um, but will probably be in person again this year, given everything's kind of back to normal-ish. Um, but we bring in all kinds of people. And I normally start with a topic and we just kind of go from there. Sometimes we've talked about the specifics of training. Sometimes we talk about um, culture. Sometimes it bleeds into all of it. Sometimes it bleeds into none of it. But it's just fun getting people together and, and hearing people discuss. Um, my one rule is if you're there, you're there to share. You know, I don't want somebody there that that just wants to sit. I want to hear from everybody. Um, that that's the the reason the thing started was so that I could get everybody in the same place and bounce ideas off of each other. So it's not like a normal clinic where one person's just sitting and talking. It, it's really a, just a big discussion, and that's the best part about it. If I lived closer to Illinois and I were invited, I would definitely be there. But maybe there are coaches listening who can help or be a part of it somehow. And um, they can reach out to you in that case. Right, Coach? Absolutely. Absolutely. I host a virtual clinic every year. And last year, I invited Ryan Gregson uh, to be a part of that clinic. And he made himself available to answer questions. And a grand total of two people showed up. And I'm thinking, wow, either my Instagram has a pathetic number of followers or people need to understand the value of these types of interactions. Yeah. Because I, I love the idea of sharing training and um, people skills, the, the, everything coaches need to elevate their game. For sure. And honestly, even the coaches, this isn't the right, even if you're a coach and you think you've got it going the right way, it's great to hear people doing the same things as you to confirm that you are doing it the right way, or maybe they can tweak something that you're doing. I mean, some of the best coaches, you know, Dan Iverson, he asked the absolute best questions and he, he's the greatest guy. I mean, he'd sit at a clinic and just sit back. And at the end of the thing, you go talk to him and figure out what he pulled out of it. I mean, he's one of the best coaches in high school history. And here we are, he's, he's learning at clinics, right? Like who does that? You know, the greatest coaches do that. So if, if there's room in his brain to squeeze a little bit more in, anybody's got room to squeeze it in there. Now let's talk training. Let's start with some general training principles that you think can apply not just to your high school 5K runners and track runners, but to anybody out there who is attempting to train in a smart manner. Sure. So for us, our base, okay, so let's start with this. Your body is just simply adapting to the stimulus that you're giving it. I mean, we, we over, in my opinion, we over uh, think about VO2 or economy we're trying to work hard and recover from it. That's it. There's different ways to do that, but I mean, that's essentially all you're doing. And so what we do is a lot of our training is based on time because if your body doesn't feel good and you need to recover a little bit more, I don't want you to have to struggle through five miles. I would rather you get out the door and get 35 minutes in. I, I don't, the volume doesn't matter because your body is just adapting to the stimulus you're giving it. Now, I say that, and I, there are coaches that give mileage, and I'm completely on board with it because they're taking those things into account. But I think the person who is just generally hand out the calendar, you're doing this amount of volume every day, doesn't matter. I, I, think, I think we can do better. Um, I think that if you're not making those adjustments, we can do better as coaches. Um, but a lot of ours is based on time. So 
Sometimes that even includes workouts. So instead of doing 800s, we may be doing three minute intervals or we, we might be doing four minute intervals if we're doing thousands, right? There, there's, a, there's several things that we could be doing as far as time is concerned. I think it not only takes pressure off, but it also lets me calculate amount of time of stimulus of a work, a workout in a workload for a specific training aid. Instead of, hey, all the varsity kids are doing um, four by mile repeat today, I can really dial in on a freshman or a first year runner and a, a senior in the same workout and just know that their training volumes are need to be different. Um, and look at the time of stimulus that they're running, not only on the day, but for the workout. So sometimes their workout volume might be the same, but then their recovery volume the next day may be completely different based on trying to have a senior or a freshman run up with a group. They're obviously going to have a lighter day the next day. Um, and I think when I when we put it in terms of time for the kids, it's easier for them to swallow and get through. Um, and it's worked really well. So essentially, when kids come in from for us, um, we like them as freshmen to run between three to four hours a week. Okay? And now I say this, and my wife, who was a cheerleader in high school, has kind of been on my same running plan uh, along the way as well. So it works for adults as, as well. And by the time they get done, we want them to be able to run between six to seven hours a week. Um, and, and if you're a mileage person, I mean, that's going to come out anywhere between 60 to 70 miles a week um, most of the time um, based on their recovery. Um, I'm sorry, but their warm ups and, and everything involved time wise. Um, so we really like to go on time um, and it, it helps helps them understand a little bit more. It helps them chunk out what they need to do. And I honestly think it feels like it's less. You tell a kid they just go out for 30 minutes and come back. You know, if they feel good, maybe they're running close to four and a half miles. If they don't feel good, maybe they're running, you know, three and a half or uh, three and three quarters. So um, we do a lot as far as that is concerned. We really try to work on training age and not actual age um, and what people respond to because everybody's a little different. Um, I've got uh, our fastest 800 kid is a sophomore who plays soccer. Um, his volume was significantly less than the kids equal age. Um, but because of what he's capable of, I mean, he run 159 for us, you know, he's a good kid. So training is very specific to the individual, but it's also very specific to your age and the other things that you're doing. Yeah, I, I agree that a lot of the mileage prescriptions and workout formulas that have been handed down from generation to generation are skewed towards the elite end of the sport. So all my training is in minutes, just like you, uh, to account for the fitness level of the athlete you have in front of you. Yeah, and here's the other thing, where you're at and where you're training is also a big part of it. I mean, for you, by 8 a.m., it could be 100 degrees outside. In, in the summertime for us, it's the same way. And so based on when a kid is able to get their run in, especially in big training blocks like summer, you have to be really um, intentional about the volume you're prescribing them because should they be able to get up and run early? Yeah, but maybe they're working a job and they're, uh, they're at their job till 10 o'clock at night. I can't expect them to get out of bed at 5.30 or 6. It, it's just a, a never-ending cycle. They'll be spiraling down if I do that. I've got to make adjustments accordingly to what they're doing in the rest of their life, not just in their running life. So it's a big, big, big part of it. And now that we're on the topic of training volume, I know that's important to you and it's important in your system. You're, you, you might characterize your, your training philosophy as high volume, relatively speaking. How does volume get added in your programs? Are, do you believe in volume at intensity or or lengthening the, not lengthening, but increasing the duration of easy runs? How, how are you programming those increases into your um, plans? It's, it's actually, it's funny that you just asked this because Travis Fleck, the University of Idaho coach and Dave Frank and Chris Johnson out in Oregon, I just had this conversation about, you know, we often make jumps based on calendar years and age, but is that the point at which kids are adjusting to stimulus, right? How, do, what, how is the fact that we know they're ready to make a jump? You know, what's the indicator to us? 
and we i don't still don't have a good answer to that but it's funny because it i mean it leads perfect you know we try to add a half an hour of volume per season so from cross country to track if a freshman is running three hours a week for us as a freshman we try to have them run 330 for the majority of track season um, i'm not a up and down type of person um, i do mess with like you said i do mess with um, the intensity um, for the volume but um, one of the things we do is if we have a very high intense workout, they double that amount of time. So for example, if we race and they race for 15 minutes, then that goes to 30 minutes of their time. Um, we try to do things like that um, during race season, because honestly, I don't care about hitting that number. The number is just a rough estimate of the stimulus we're trying to give them. Um, tracking it, if you, were to, if you were to say they're going three hours a week and you looked at every kid's log, um, you wouldn't see three hours across the board. That's just kind of a rough where we're trying to get um, with the intensities and the things that we're doing. I think that the volume is way more important in the off seasons and early in the season where we're trying to hit something, but then the race specifics of, of things and energy systems as we go, as long as they're getting what they need. I mean, I gave up cool downs. Now, we don't run cool downs anymore. We walk them. You know, I, I don't add that stuff in there. I don't care. Oh, you need to get another 10 minutes in. You don't just go run 10 minutes and, and say that's worth anything. I'd rather you walk 10 minutes and talk to your teammates and talk to your coaches and enjoy being around each other. So 30 minutes a season, don't care about the extra stuff. It doesn't matter. Adjust accordingly. And if you don't hit three hours for the week or six hours for the week, but you've done everything we've asked you, that's all we care about. Uh, track the stimulus, not the volume. What do your recovery days look like? Your, your easy runs um, across the board, is everyone running a standard, let's say 30 minute easy run? Do you like to cap those easy runs to make sure that your athletes are recovering? And, and how often do you prescribe these recovery days? I know that can vary based on you know day-to-day -day stuff, but in general, you know, Maybe it's maybe it's two recovery days and then another hard day. I know that's a loaded question, so take that apart as you see fit. I, I'd honestly say that probably seventy percent of our runs are easy runs, um, and I, I have a difference between the easy run and a recovery run. A recovery run is um, we just had a workout. Let's make sure um, that we can carry on a conversation. Um, you know, people drastically describe our prescribed paces and it's completely flat here in Illinois, but you can't predict the wind. I mean, I've got a nice outdoor patio set that I haven't been able to put out yet because it's still like 25 mile an hour winds out there. Um, so for me, uh, a recovery run is just nice and easy. Let's get done. We'll do some strides when we get done. That could be an hour for a kid. Um, that could be 30 minutes for a kid uh, or anywhere in between based on what their volume is. Now an easy run, an easy run is we may start easy, but the progression of the run, we may get faster as we go if we feel good. There's not an urgency to do that, but what, what we try to do with an easy run is if it still feels easy to go fast, do it because your body's just adjusting to the stimulus you're giving it. And if you feel good, yeah, there may be a little bit of um, fatigue that sets in after the fact, but if you feel good running fast, let's do it. I mean, that's the whole goal, right? You don't want to suffer every step of your race. You want to feel good for most of it. So um, recovery runs and easy runs are probably 70% of what we do. Um, a normal training cycle for us is 14 days. Um, and during track season, we only run long run once every 14 days. During cross country season, we'll do twice in that time period. Um, and so Monday would be our long run. Wednesday would be some type of workout and then race on Saturday. And so we'll have strides and we'll have speed stuff and we'll have strength stuff sprinkled in. Um, we try to lift and do things heavy um, on hard days. I want easy days easy. We'll do med ball throws or we'll do wickets on easy days, but that's really the extent of the hard things that we'll do on recovery days. We want to make sure that they're recovered, ready to go for the next one. On a hard day, I would say hard should be on scale of one to 10, it should be a seven. If it's more than a seven, Either your body's not recovered, ready to go, or I screwed up the numbers somewhere along the way. Um, that doesn't mean that every rep of every everything we do is going to be a seven. Sometimes it may be a little more difficult, but in general, if you were to 
hand it out. It should be about seven. And that's changed for me. I, I used to be under the mindset that once or twice a week, you went, you went as hard as you could. You know, you, you had to feel what discomfort was like in order to run fast. Because that's what I did. Uh, but the more we learn, the more we know that that's just not true. And, and staying on the topic of recovery, let's say you have a 16, 17 minute 5K boy. What would be a pace that you feel comfortable that boy running in in a recovery run, not an easy run? Are, are, you, are, are you even strictly monitoring that? Um, I, the only time I monitor it is when we have too many recovery days and we don't have enough easy days, meaning I think that they are not taking advantage of their opportunity to get a little bit more volume with a little more discomfort. Um, so not that it needs to be fast, but on a recovery day, a kid like that, you know, if they're running anywhere between 6.45 and 7.30 pace, um, because it's flat in Illinois, I mean, we've got no hills. The only hill I've got is an overpass, right? We don't go up it very often because of traffic. So on a flat day, it's very easy to roll a pace like that because I don't have to worry about hills. I don't have turns. I mean, I turn once a mile, right? Like square blocks. So there's a lot of factors that speed up some of our recovery days just by simple fact that they're technically easy runs. No elevation change, uh, not a lot of turns. I don't have to worry about traffic in a lot of places. Um, it's easy to just roll with rhythm at a pace like that. Um, for the easy runs, I mean, some of those kids – We'll run close to six flat pace at the end and feel good and they'll race home and I'll be happy with it. I mean, they're not doing it the whole time, right? But they're feeling good and, and rolling. And I, I appreciate that. Also knew for me as a kid, how much of a confidence boost that was to know that I was running fast and feeling good. And so like, that's the athlete in me. That's okay with that as well. I mean, it's not going to ruin their workout the next day because I never put those days where they're going to run up to or hurt what they're doing. Um, so I, I'm not super strict with it, but we try to give them a little bit of an idea where they should be. What about tips on keeping runners healthy, which goes hand in hand with recovery? Sleep. Coach Vandersteen uh, got me on sleep. I mean, championship sleep, 10 hours a night. I mean, do it. Like if you're serious about this sport, do it. Um, you know, that's one of the things I'll brag on my son a little bit is, you know, we're in bed by nine o'clock at our house pretty much every night and we're getting up at whatever time it is, but we're not staying up late. Um, sleep is the number one thing. If you want to improve just hands down. Uh, the second thing in my opinion is getting enough fuel. Um, most kids aren't in the sport, aren't eating tons of sugar or, you know, drinking gallons of, of pop a day. You know, that stuff in moderation, there's nothing wrong with some of those things. Um, but they're typically not getting enough fuel. I mean, when we talk about nutrition with our team, we don't talk about what we cut out. We talk about what we add. Um, we always want to try to add an extra um, fruit or add an extra vegetable, add a different color of vegetable or add a different color of fruit. You know, those little extra things um, we take a I have them uh, recommend that they take a post run recovery shake every Every single run, whether it's an easy day or it's a workout, it's just uh, Gatorade and um, a whey protein. Um, Danny Mackey, Brooks Beast, is a good friend of mine. And I said, what do you do? And he said, take this. It's been 20 minutes. And so every day um, they've got their shake that they, they should be taking every day. So that's big. You know, if you want to race like a race car, you've got to put race fuel in it. And so that's super important for us to make sure that we're recovering to set up the next day. Um, and it's, it's important for the kids to understand that that shake isn't for today. That shake is for tomorrow because your run is over. All you can do now is recover and get ready for the next one. And the more you can get ready for the next one, the better that one's going to feel and the faster you're going to get. So even though it's post run, it's technically pre run for the next one. So, um, we make a big emphasis on some of those things. Sometimes they stick. Sometimes they don't it's like their own darts. Sometimes they stick where you want them to. And sometimes they don't. Fueling and sleep. Absolutely critical. I couldn't agree more. All and the other I stuff. I mean, you can, you can do sand walks, you can do hurdle mobility, you can do all that other stuff, but if kids aren't doing those things, you can't out coach it. 
Yeah, and you mentioned mobility. So that leads me to my next question. I know the research linking strength training with injury prevention is somewhat tenuous, but I know you mentioned your runner's lift. Can you talk briefly about what that looks like over the course of the season? How are you incorporating strength training? So I'm one of our strength training teachers at the school. And so if they're in my class, we're in the weight room three to four days a week. And I write their specifics on their workouts. And we do a lot of Olympic lifts um, for mobility and strength. Um, regardless of how people feel about strength training, there is no negative effect to your frame being able to handle more of a stress by adding muscular strength to it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean bulk. That just means being able to hold the your your own load in your own frame and so in my opinion for a high school athlete th there's no downside to being able to get into the weight room and, and doing things correctly on a consistent basis you don't have to be in there a long time you don't have to do tons of things but if you can do a little bit every day a little bit every day is going to be way more important than trying to do it two days a week and let's do all these things and then we'll be in there you know we get in there monday we'll go in there thursday I just don't see it. If I ran like that, I wouldn't get anything out of it. I can tell you I wouldn't get anything out of that because as I start back at this thing, that's how it started, you know, off of injury. You don't get anything out of it. You got to be doing these things consistently. And I think that the people that don't value it don't do it consistently. They may do it two or three times a week. It's not that we're in there bench pressing five days a week, but we're trying to touch on some of our skeletal strength. Um, that is not leg related. We do very little leg stuff. Um, we deadlift, though, to increase testosterone production after long runs. I mean, we do things in the weight room, not necessarily just to build strength, but also to dump chemicals in our body that help us stay healthy. I mean, there's a, such a huge benefit to that stuff. Um, now I wish I was smarter where I could explain it better, but I just listen to people that are smarter than me to tell me to do it. So. <laughs> No, that was that was quite good. And we could devote an entire episode just to strength training. Yeah, for sure. So from from strengthening the chassis to the metabolic side of this equation, I think we can all agree that building someone's engine or increasing their capacity for aerobic exercise and extending that concept even further, maximizing their aerobic power in particular, improving things like their velocity at lactate threshold is key to getting faster in the distance events. But there are many ways to get there. And I think you and I are on the same page that a multi-pace training model where you keep in touch with all paces mm -hmm. or energy systems throughout the season is the path to take, generally speaking. So maybe you can explain, or we can do this together. What are these paces or energy systems or intensities that you like to emphasize to one degree or another across a macro cycle? So I think, I think as, we, as we talk about it or, or we think about it, we also have to remember that in the, in the makeup of the human body, a three mile race is not very far. So although we consider it distance running or even junior high where they're maybe run 3K or, or two miles, for that age athlete, it is, for them, seems like a, a big feat. But in the energy systems within the human body, the, the human body can go a lot longer than that at that age at a much more intense effort than what we put at it. We're not anywhere close to maximizing what the human body can do as far as training these kids. I and mean, we're seeing that, right? The breakthroughs in times over the last, 16 months has just been unbelievable to what we thought was fast when we were kids, right? Like it's just completely different. So I think the important thing to remember is that even though we call three miles, you know, long race or endurance or a 5k long race, it's not physiologically. It's not what we want to think is one thing, but what the body can handle is completely different. So as we talk about what we put in our cycles, um, we have to make sure that we respect that to the human body, the mind may think it's hard, but to the body, it's not. We don't break kids from racing during cross country season. They don't end up in the hospital at the end of their runs. Um, well, most don't end up in the hospital in their runs, right? Thousands and thousands of these kids do it and they're fine. There's nothing wrong with them at all. 
So as we include these things, we've got to take into account that it's a short amount of time. And I think we do a lot of sheer speed stuff. We do a lot of what I would call uh, economy pace, which is faster than race pace, um, maybe a little larger reservoir, but we do a lot of things that are fast because in the scheme of the human body, that three miles stimulus is fast. It doesn't take a lot of time. And so we're trying to prep the body um, for not only to be able to endure by running longer runs, you know, 90 minute long run, increase the mitochondria density within our cells, you know, all that stuff. Right. But we also need to tune it up like a race car and make sure that when it's ready to go really, really fast, that it can handle going really, really fast through the strength stuff we do through um, um, some of the, the VO2 max, which I do less of. But I think it's important to experience those types of efforts um, as the cycle goes on. And if you miss them, if you don't include them. It's going to be foreign to the body when it's time to do it, which would be the race. Um, so keeping all those things present all the time is, is short as far as the life cycle of the body is concerned. Um, but the human brain sometimes thinks it's a big deal to do. Yeah, so let, let's go through that again. You have your speed work, which maybe, maybe we can call max velocity yep. work. And we, you have your economy work your VO2 yep. work, and would you call the next one your threshold work? Yeah, you yeah for sure. Okay. And, and of course, the, the easy, long run type efforts. And some people with threshold will say, I think um, they'll call it marathon effort, um, which is the next one between threshold and easy run, and they'll do marathon effort runs, um, which I just haven't got – into the specifics of it, but I know some great coaches that do use that terminology um, in, in those paces for some of their runs, especially some of their long runs efforts. Um, but like I said, I, I don't get into that specific with it. So, Yeah, because you have two lactate thresholds and you have that, that critical velocity or LT2, and then you have your LT1 and everything between those two thresholds is what you might call um, the mot, the, um, I'm sorry, not the moderate, the, the heavy domain of exercise or zone two, if we're working with a three zone model. But yeah, that's yeah. in coach speak, we might call that marathon pace ish that, that, you know, that yeah. in between. So and see, you, I, ahead, to, to me, and this is, this was, comes from one of my clinics. How do we truly know that we're hitting that cycle or, or, or that phase, you know, I just think there's so much blending even on the day. Like, for example, if we're going to run a threshold workout, the first, let's say we're doing thousands, right? The first thousand rep at threshold effort should feel like recovery pace. How does the body know? So there's so much blending of effort because theoretically, if we did this correctly, the pace would actually get slower as the workout went on because of the stimulus of effort that it would take in order to hit that particular pace. It shouldn't go the other way around if we're truly hitting L2. You know, if we're truly hitting those zones, it would actually go backwards. It wouldn't go the other way. But as coaches, we want kids to be confident and go faster as they go, which takes us out of our VO2 or our threshold. It takes us out of that effort. And uh, so there's so much blending. Uh, I call it one thing, but what actually happens during, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not Scott Christensen. I'm not picking their fingers every, every repetition. You know, I don't, I don't know exactly where they're at on the, the chart, uh, cycle their oxygen. So, um, I blend a lot of things. Well, that, that's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask you next. And I think we should use an example for this one. Let's say you're going to do a session like eight by a K uh, or let's do it by time, right? Eight by three minutes at threshold or LT2. So that critical power, critical velocity or what some coaches would call the anaerobic threshold. And you're gonna give them short rest. So you're gonna give them like a minute rest, let's say in between those repeats. How do you prescribe intensity to your athletes are you going by feel are you telling them what it should feel like or are you giving them a pace to shoot 
for and, ba and and how do you base those paces for them if that's the case? Yes, to all of that. Uh, I think throughout the course of the season, um, we get a little more specific, but the example you just gave early on in the season when you're running whatever by three minutes, you want to give them a, a feeling that they, they should, how they should be running. As we have more data on where their actual fitness is as the season goes on, then we can be more specific with the pace that they should be running um, and what we don't want them to go faster than. Because we're not trying to extend them beyond their limits. We're trying to keep them there or slightly less than. Um, assuming, assuming that less than is on time is not because they're not capable of. And we're assuming that they just have more they could get there if they wanted to. Um, so I often give them cues on how they should feel or what the recovery is like. If at the end of 60 seconds, you don't feel like you're ready. Um, we may extend it and say, hey, let's just pull it down a little bit because the heart rate is obviously still staying up if you don't feel like you can start the next one when it's time to start the next one. Um, so those cues and those things for them to look for is, is a lot of trust in them to make those adjustments on the fly as they need to. Excellent. Yeah, my, my, my initial phase of training is all effort-based. And so you're giving them those cues how they should feel. And then after we have a time trial, then I go off percentage of the VO2 max. Yep. And that's just, then, then we can dial in those paces. Yeah, so our, our 800, our four by eight here within the last week, you know, towards the end of the season, I would say, hey, let's, we're gonna start with three by 200 at mile effort. And doesn't matter what the wind is, don't look at your watch, I just want mile effort. Because for them, mile effort is gonna be faster than mile effort because they feel fresh, right? So they feel like they should have some level of discomfort through that 200 being a mile. But we all know that the first 600 meters of the mile doesn't feel like you're running at all, right? You feel like you're walking as you're in that race. And so if they feel like that, they're going to be too slow. But if I tell them mile effort, then they're going to be probably just a little bit faster than mile pace, which then helps us dial in for that 800 paces or faster as we finish out the workout. I think it would be helpful, Coach, if we go through the season in chunks, not in terrible detail, but maybe you can give us some sample workouts, one that you would do during the summer, one that you would do during uh, the middle of the season and then towards the late of the season, later on in the season um, and, and pick your, your event. Maybe you want to do this for 5k cross country or track, whatever is easier. Um, so if we do, if we go cross um, for us, a lot of early in the season, a lot of our stuff revolves threshold. So I don't run any workout the same twice um, during the course of the season, because honestly, we both know that whether it be 500 meters or 400 meters or 1,000 meters or 1,100 meters. For us as coaches, we're looking for the time of stimulus. So let's say, for example, um, I, I've asked a group this before. I said, what distance do you guys feel most confident in, during workouts? And I've had kids that say, we feel really confident for 800. So then I can say, hey, we're going to run. We can run two minutes and 45 seconds or we're going we're gonna to run this loop. Um, and, and I can prescribe the pace and I can prescribe the rest interval because the rest interval is what makes the workout. And so when, when we are able to do that, a lot of our threshold stuff early in the year is based on what the weather's doing, where we have to run it, what they feel confident with, um, trying to give them some ownership into the training plan um, to help them build. You know, I think one of the things we get lost as coaches is every one of our athletes should be able to coach the junior high kids when we leave. Right. We should educate them enough that they should be able to do that. So giving them some of that ownership is big. So early in the year, a lot of threshold work um, based on time, <coughs> excuse me, um, to help them just build a bigger motor. I mean, we'll do speed stuff, but you get the idea. Chunk it in there. Once we get um, into the meat of our racing season, um, we try to be a little bit more specific. So we would do um, maybe a little bit more K work. Um, we do a lot of visual, well, we do a few visualization workouts where there will be coaches that stand on the course and we will talk about the state meet course as they go through where they're visualizing it. 
They always run too fast because they get psyched up, right? But we try to be a little bit more specific about how we're doing workouts. You know, Detweiler is flat to the rest of the world, but there's a little bit of an, an uphill to finish um, at the state meet. And so we work on going uphill. Uh, we do some hill work um, specific during a workout. Um, we don't have a lot of hill options, but we really try to do that at certain times in the middle of the season. When we get to the end of the season, uh, stuff is shorter, faster. Um, we run our staple workout towards the end of the year. It's called 555. Real simple. Five minutes, pretty much as hard as you can go. Five minute jog recovery, and then five more minutes as hard as you can go. I um, mean, it's a big confidence boost for the kids, and it's short chunked, right? We're only doing 10 minutes worth of work, but it's at a high intensity effort. And so the week of the state meet for us, we mile time trial. You know, we are racing the week of the state meet for cross country because the volume is, is a little bit lower, but the intensity is up. So we want to make sure that we, we meet all those energy system needs as we go um, and really start to dial it in as we get close to the end. Because you can't, you can just help confidence at the end. I mean, that's really what the mile time trial is about. I was actually going to ask you about that. So some good 5K, um, I call them indicator sessions, but they're confidence boosters. So you guys do a mile time trial. And what was that workout? It was five minutes hard, five minutes easy, five minutes hard. Yep. And that's it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And we do it on our home course. Uh, we only run once a year is on a road. And so the goal for the guys is to get through the mile mark. And then you can cut across and make it to the, the mile and a half mark in five minutes. And so they get there and then their goal is to get another mile at the end. And so every, pretty much every all-stater we've had in cross country is able to go mile, mile on that uh, 555 workout. So um, for them, it's a big confidence boost. And for our girls, there's the same, same type of spot. Our all-staters, top 25 in the state, have been able to get to this certain spot, you know, make this extra turn. And so we have, we just kind of have an indicator like that. They can freshen up. They enjoy running it. Um, but more confidence boost than anything that time of the year. And coach, we all have those runners that make us think outside the box because they have these unique strengths or weaknesses that we have to cater to and maybe they don't fit the molds. And I'm wondering when you have a team, a cross country team, a track team, you don't always have the luxury of course of individualizing a training plan, but to what extent are you doing that with your runners? Um, so I, I typically push out a first, second, third, fourth year training plan. And then with each individual kid, with their ability to sit on the teeter totter and keep me balanced in the relationship we have is our ability to adjust what they do. So if they're regularly communicating with me, I'm able to make adjustments to them better. But if they're not, <laughs> obviously it's harder for me to make those changes into their training plan. But I honestly would say that most of our kids are on some version of what we have, but very few of them are very strict to what we have. Um, honestly, some of our best runners are not strict to the training plan because we make adjustments on the fly. They say, hey, I'm just not recovered enough or, hey, I'm feeling great. Can I do this? And I, I give them ownership. Absolutely. I'm just your advisor. This is what I would do, but I, you can vary from it if it works. Um, if it doesn't work, we learn and we go from there. So maybe, maybe four plans, one for each age group, but none of them may be on it. Makes sense. Yeah. For perfect sense. And if you didn't have to contend with multiple peaks and you had enough time to taper an athlete, would you consider reducing their volume for about a week or two and maintaining the intensity and frequency of training? Or do you generally dislike the idea of tapering i don't like tapering um i i <laughs> chris johnson if he ever listens to this he knows it's a bad word in, in my brain and just because i i'm adjusting my body's adjusting to the stimulus i'm giving it and if i'm not giving it those other stimuluses then it's going to adjust differently and we know that how quickly the body can adjust now people can do it right i just i'm not smart enough to figure it out um, we vary our intensity, but we keep our volume pretty close. I mean, we may drop a half hour, um, our, our, our volume, but our volume stays pretty high, um, especially during cross country season. 
and we've had some really good results with it. Um, now, the atmosphere and there's other things that bring that um, success, but we've had more success kind of keeping our volume where it's at. And, and keep in mind, our volume is not crazy. I mean, those kids, my boys are maybe running 50 miles a week. And so they'll come down to maybe 40 miles a week um, during the state series. So it's not, it's not like, um, it's not like we're running 80 or 90 miles a week and just keeping it there all the way to the end. Right. We're, we're uh, at a controllable level and you take uh, 10 miles off of 50 and it's a 20% drop. So um, it, it's a, I don't like the word taper, um, but Maybe we do it a little bit, and I just don't know it. Don't tell Chris I said that, though. <laughs> it's it's definitely not easy to get right, and it's it's so individual, varies from person to person. So you have to yeah. really be working with someone for a long time to figure out what works and what doesn't, and maybe by the time you figure it out, it's too late. Uh, but yeah, that again, that's a a topic for it, another episode entirely. How, and this is the last question, Coach, I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. How do you get kids to believe in your approach? Because we, we know that that buy-in is so important. Has it been easy for you to get kids to believe in your training? And then on a related note, believe in themselves come race day. So I, I think the, the ultimate answer to that is, is is the kids investment into the sport because I'm never going to ask them to do something that I wouldn't do or I didn't believe in. And I think that they know the amount of time and commitment that I put into this sport and, and the amount of people that I talk to to try to get it right for them, that a lot of those kids um, are willing to buy in and do the things necessary because they know that I'm not making this stuff up. Like I'm getting information from credible people. I mean, we, we've won a, a fair amount of trophies here on top of the other things, you know, that we're getting training from. So if they don't, when you walk in our school and you look at the trophy case, we go down the Allstate Hall and those 500 Allstaters don't say that we know what we're doing at some point. Like, I don't know that I can ever get you to believe in what we do, but those things, you know, the continued success and not caring about performance, caring about the person, I think helps with that buy-in. And, and I, I truly... I mean, I, they know that at the end of the day, I don't care how fast they run. If you're making bad decisions and you're one of the fastest kids on the team, I'm going to try to fix the things that you're doing outside of your life and not care about the running. Like that's way more important to me. If you leave my program and I'm willing to write you a letter of recommendation, like that's, that's important to me. Um, how fast you run is a byproduct of those other things. And so the buy-in comes because I care about who they are not about how they run. And when they understand that, that's way more important, way more important in the scheme of life. Um, some of them get it. Some of them don't. Some of them send me long text messages years later. Um, and I like those, but I wish they figured out a little sooner sometimes too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really think that's the perfect note to end on today. I, I, I want to thank you, Jason, for sharing your story and opening up about what has worked for you and your athletes. I appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks, yep. Jason. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Yeah, it was fun. I think we put together some good content for other coaches out there. And I, I know we have quite a big audience and we're growing. So and, and a lot of people will will click back and listen to older episodes and you will forever be a part of the steadfast running family. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I, you know, this to me, like I've learned so much from so many people sitting on couches and people coming to my house. Like to me, it's valuable because, because I learned so much from so many other people. Like I feel like nothing, the only original thing I've ever thought of is, is shredding PRs into a, into a paper shredder, right? Everything else that we come up with is from somebody else. So I, I love doing stuff like this because it's just sharing the information that was shared with me by somebody else. So, and so this is awesome what you're doing. It, absolutely awesome. Getting that information out. 
the world of running isn't secret and there's no rocket science behind it. But I think when people understand that they're doing it the right way, it, it really helps the sport out because then it gives them confidence and gives their kids confidence too. Yeah, it's been a privilege to speak to you today, Jason. And you're so well connected. Um, you have, I mean, high school coaches, professional coaches, that if you have an interest in listening to anyone take the hot seat like you did today, let me know and, and I can reach out to them. Um, I think, you know, I don't know if you've got Dave Frank on your list. Um, but Dave Frank, I, I, I got. Hey, he, okay. he's already on our show. Okay. They, I love Dave. I absolutely love Dave. I really don't go to a bar Dave. with Dave, but I love Dave. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yeah, he was one of my favorites. It's funny you mentioned him. Yeah, he, uh, he not only knows what he's doing, but he, he's along the same lines as me. Like, he'll give something out, but he just adjusts everything on the fly depending on who they are. And he's the one who really gave me confidence to continue to do those things. Like, okay, if this guy – <laughs> is doing this on a regular basis with all his kids like it's okay if i'm just adjusting on the fly and have confidence with it and it gives the kids more confidence so yeah i love dave yeah he's on my speed dial yeah and jay johnson would be great to have on here too but i haven't been able to reach him jay would be absolutely fantastic um i let me know and i i can reach out to him if, if you know kind of roughly when you want to do it he's a busy guy but um I, i'd text him in a heartbeat He'd love to do it. Um, maybe you can, you can, you know, vet for me now, now that you know me better and you can say, this is a good guy. He's not going to put you on the spot or anything. I just, I just want to pay tribute to all these great coaches. And he, he brings us all together. Like he is the glue. Like that's the best part is like, Bull, have you ever been to Boulder running clinics? No, I, it's one of my bucket list items. I would love to. The problem is you're going to put it on there and you'll never not go back. Like it's, it's worth it. I, and not necessarily just because of the clinics, the clinics are okay, but it's the social stuff around it. I mean, we, we talked, I mean, I was up till like four o'clock in the morning talking about running stuff, you know, like I should be in bed. My plane leaves in three hours. Like I need to be in bed. And I'm not, you know, I've got an Olympian sitting on my couch in my hotel room, you know, like it just, it's crazy. Thank God for our wives, right? They support what we do because we otherwise, yeah. I, I don't know if she'd be happy if I, she knew I was up till four o'clock in the morning, but singing, singing karaoke at some bar out in Colorado, but who knows? She may enjoy it too. Who knows? Well, yeah, man, consider, consider me a friend. And um, if I, if I ever have a question, I know I can reach out to you. So it works both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if, uh, if you have an idea of somebody you want to get connected with, and I'll, I'll say something to Jay, um, but um, I, I, let me know. Uh, the world is so small and I give my son most of the credit for making the world small for me. You know, <laughs> he's the one who made it real, you know, you know, uh, that man ran Oregon. Right. And so, so he's friends with all those guys. Um, you know, Ash Neaton was his teammate and, and all these guys. And, and so before the state meet, Lance is, is on the phone and I say, I'm like, who are you talking to? He's like, uh, uh, Andy Wheat Wheating's telling me what I should do in between my races. And so he's like, he's, he's calling Andrew Wheating up and talking. I'm like, like, you guys can't bother these guys. He's like, I didn't, he wished me luck. And so I was just asking him questions. I'm like, geez, <laughs> like this is such a fun world to be in. Yeah. Give, give Lance 10 years and he, he might be on the other end of this mic. Yeah, yeah for sure. Or, <laughs> or maybe he can interview someone like Vin Lanana, you know, I'm yeah. sure he can, he'll have the, the clout to to reach out to people like that someday well in the crazy here's the crazy thing is like with robbie andrews and josette norris their his godmother is married to their chiropractor for team reebok and so it's such a small world he's always been a robbie andrews fan but then we find out that getty is their cairo so now lance has this uh the singlet and shoes and the whole racing kit from when robbie broke four minutes for the first time we have it framed in the house wow. and it, it's just absolutely wild to think you know he's been watching that uh ncaa 800 a million times to come find out he, now he's a friend right like just makes the world so small for him so it's absolutely 
absolutely crazy. Oh, that's great, man. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to publish this. Uh, I'm going to listen to it today and by tomorrow it'll, it'll be live. So I'll send you well, the link. Awesome. I appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon.